So welcome to today's event. I'm Gemma monk Hartley from Heritage Green Networks Building Sense Group, an initiative that was started in 2020 to bring together people, information and professional expertise to help with the challenge of making homes comfortable year round in the face of both high heating bills and carbon carbon emissions. Today, we're delighted to be able to host this webinar on behalf of the Future Ready Homes Programme, of which HGN are project partners. It's been running now in Shropshire, Powys and Herefordshire since early 2022, and being delivered by March's Energy Agency and 7Y Energy Agencies, with the support of groups like us, HGN in Herefordshire, Lightfoot in Powys and Zero Carbon Shropshire in Shropshire. The main focus of the Future Ready Homes Programme has been to promote and support good practice energy retrofit across homes in the market area. And they've done this through webinar series while we're here today, retrofit advice, fully funded home retrofit surveys and plans, which sadly have at the moment all been snaffled up, um, and events like Green Doors or Green Open Homes. Um, um, which took hang on. In October. So let's introduce you to our speaker. Uh, today we have Gervais Mangwana, who is not a new face to us at all, actually. Um, he has done a webinar for us in the past um, about being heat pump ready. And some of you may have also visited his current Herefordshire home as part of Green Doors. Um, but actually today he's here to talk oh. about the retrofit. Oh. Uh, the retrofit he undertook um, on his Manchester home which is of cavity built construction. Um, so by cavity built, we're kind of talking 90s, 20s, 1930s um, modern construction. Um, so hopefully that will be of interest to you. And Gervais, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Thanks for having me. You. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Yes, please. Uh, okay. Oh, no, that's, uh, that's not quite the right one. Oh, dear. Best laid plans. <laughs> Let's try. Um... Oh, why is it doing that? It's so annoying. Uh, it wants to do it on my other screen, so um, unfortunately what that means is I won't be looking at you, so. That's okay, you're, you're only small when you're screen sharing anyway, so we won't even know. Okay, sorry about this. We did try this beforehand and it all seemed to be okay. How's that? Perfect. Yeah? Perfect. Great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, yes. As Gemma said, some of you may may have visited my home here. I moved to Herefordshire in 2018. Um, and actually, this home here is partially cavity wall. I, I recalled, actually, I remembered it, it, a, a bit more modern cavity. Um, so just thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself. I... Um, had a had a life in music industry until the early noughties, uh, then went to the Centre for Alternative Technology and did one of their masters. And from that, got an interest in existing buildings, um, and and has sort of since sort of uh, come into a career working on retrofit, basically. But at the time that this retrofit was done, which was two thousand and fourteen, that was I was very new on that journey. Um, and and I didn't know an, an awful lot. I was kind of finding my way, and in fact, this was quite a lot of how I how I found out um, oh, I, how what I wanted out. to do. Um, yeah, that the house in question was built in 1961. Actually, and my wife had been living in it since 2001 um, with a friend of hers. I moved in in 2010, um, and it wasn't very comfortable. And and it clearly needed need a lot of work doing to it anyway. So uh, and we were we were preparing to have a family, so it was a logical time to do something if we were going to do something. 
Um, so yeah, we're just going to look at look at the project itself, some of the wider implications, learnings, and and then a bit of reflections, and now with some questions at the end. So this is the house before we did it. Uh, it's a very small. It, they were award winning actually. They're called um, link detached homes, so they're kind of uh, detached houses where the garage next door's garage joined onto your house and their house, if you like. But we were at the end of a row. But yeah, when they were built, there was a couple living over the road who'd been in them since they were built, and uh, who was a structural engineer, um, retired structural engineer, and they they bought it as a young couple, and and there were various things about the design that had made, meant that it was like architecturally award winning at the time, um, although a lot of these features apparently failed quite quite soon into it. But there was, it, I guess, for the time, it was it was quite radical. It was very heavily glazed, a very cheap and light, lightweight build, probably very quick to build. Um, it's quite a small place, about 80, 84 square meters, I seem to remember. Three bedrooms, one of which was very small. So it was very compact, sort of urban living. Um, we had taken the opportunity to put um, solar panels on the on the opposite roof of this, which is south facing uh, in 2011, when the fit was at its at its largest sort of rate and one of the thinkings behind that was that the, the the income stream from that would go towards funding a retrofit even though that income stream would come over many years the idea was the, the idea i was thinking about was that, that you know it's how is it affordable to do deep retrofit onto a home you have to take every opportunity that you can um, and at that time because the roof was the original roof uh, we had the roof redone prior to putting the PV on. It wasn't a very comfortable place to live in. It was it was cold. Um, so we heated it, you know, as people traditionally do with with cold homes, a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the evening, and the rest of the time was a bit hair shirt, gloves and and so forth. Um, it did badly need um modernization. There was a lot about it that hadn't really changed since since it had been built. Um I kind of treated this as a client project where my wife was a client. My client, uh, my wife has no technical knowledge, uh, no real interest in in the technical detail of it. Um, but she did want a retrofit delivered and she understood the drivers for it. So I kind of treated her as the client and what, what kind of desires she had. And she was very clear that she want, she didn't want to live in a building site. So she wanted to do whatever we did in one phase and she didn't want to live in it. And by chance, uh, an almost identical house over the road came up for rent. And that kind of a little bit governed about our time framing. So we rented a house over the road um, from which we could oversee the project. Um, and also, actually, I could look at that house sometimes to remember what the house had looked on before I'd, before I'd partly demolished it. Um, and there were some other things that we wanted to, to look at, some benefits that we wanted to see. There was only one toilet in the house um and it had no sort of utility room as such so we were able to you know this gave an opportunity to do a little bit of um a little bit of rejigging uh the porch was internal to the house uh, and it felt, felt like there was a bit of an opportunity to move that out so there was a little bit of rejigging to do um living there gave a great opportunity for investigation and i i want to stress how important i think this is for anybody who wants to undertake any level of retrofit uh knowing your home is so crucial as deeply as you possibly can is so crucial to making the right choices about what you're going to do to it no matter what your capacity for doing that is in terms of budget and logistics and whatever because the devil is unseen a lot in a retrofit i'd see i'd say but yeah at the time that we before we retrofitted we were consuming about 12 to thirteen thousand kilowatt hours of gas a year and before the solar panels had gone on it was about three and a half thousand kilowatt hours a year of electricity i had recently become an air tightness tester and so i was able to test it and at 12 meters cubed per meter second per hour permeability it is uh, what I kind of now understand to be the high end of the kind of middle bracket of existing homes. Um, sort of looking back at the house, you can kind of see the the side walls there are, are brick and the front wall and the back wall similarly are a bit of an unknown construction. It's a bit from from looking at the front of it or, or being 
inside it, you can't really tell what those walls are made of. And it was only through investigations that it became clear how the house was built. Um, so the front and back walls are really just sort of infill. And although there is block work in there, which you can see in that bottom photo, it was really just sort of kind of loosely, loosely put in. It's not structural in any way. Um, and there was a steel running across the middle of the house at the front and the back, which those sort of plinth walls were sat on. And I don't know if you can just see in the very bottom right hand corner here where my cursor is. There's a little white line there. And that is where once the cladding had come off the front and the back, you can see daylight all the way through the house from the front all the way to the back of the house. Um, and so it was it was only at sort of this level of depth that you could start to understand why the air tightness was so poor and, and why it might be quite challenging to do anything about it. Um, some of the other things that came up were finding out that the upstairs walls were made out of uh, this kind of egg box material, kind of what's called partition board. I think it was sort of a bit popular at the time, but again, you just wouldn't know until you started getting into these things. And that had serious air tightness issues. We had a little bit of thermal imaging done. I'd really thoroughly encourage you to take whatever opportunities you can get in your local area. And, you know, there's often our little funded schemes where you can uh, maybe have an air test done or get some thermography done <clears throat> that you can learn things about your home. It's good to have somebody or take some advice from somebody who knows what they're doing a little bit to interpret it. But you can quite quickly start to see the problems. And I noticed above the windows upstairs, they seem to be much, much colder than, than the other walls. Uh, and when I looked at it, the, the level of the soffits on the roof outside were at the top of the window. And I kind of started to realise that the construction of the wall above the window probably wasn't very much. And as it turned out, it was just literally just a piece of plasterboard and then almost, you know, the outside air outside it. There were places where where there had been insulation, it was missing both in internal walls or into the porch wall that was. And then down here in the bottom, a little bit seemed to be missing in the cavity wall. And, and air tightness issues again into the wall, which showed me that there was a problem, this partition board. And then this on the top right hand corner here was um, you can see cold air coming in underneath the skirting boards and between the floors, which showed me that there was a problem between the floor, between the two floors within what we call the intermediate floor void. And downstairs on the back windows it was very cold up, up above. So, yeah, the, the side walls of the house were cavity built brick on the outside with a cinder block concrete on the inside that should have been filled, must have been filled very early on with uh, urea, urea, urea formaldehyde, which isn't used any longer. Mm -hmm. um, but it did seem where I found it in the last year, it seemed to be in reasonably good condition. The front and back walls were a mix of just the windows, loose block work, bits of timber frame, steel. It really is just a sort of mishmash that was kind of covered over um and and thermally therefore like very poor performance but also very difficult to to treat a very conventional flat ceiling loft which was you know partially in, in, insulated uh and a solid floor which was very cold the original house one of its one of its novel features were that they'd installed um electric underfloor heating there was these massive thick uh cables in the floor or, or like the heating element basically not like not like matting like, like you see now but literally just thick wires running through the floor and and in 1961 i suppose we were just after that era where um you know they they'd sort of famously said that electricity our post nuclear was going to become so cheap that it wasn't any but there wasn't any point in metering it and so probably putting electric front of floor heating in seemed like a good idea at the time but apparently many of them broke down very quickly. And so the houses therefore were, were completely unheated, although it did have uh, a sort of flu lined chimney for a, for a gas fire in, in the living room. Otherwise there was, there was no other heating in the house. And I met people who'd grown up in those houses and, and suffered very, very coldly when they were growing up. Um, the ground floor internal wall was just a single wall across the back, which was single skin um, and had two large doorways in the structural engineer over the, the road who came in when he saw that after I'd stripped it back, uh, had, uh, had kittens actually realizing that he was living in a house exactly like it. So we bricked one of those up. Uh, and that's an example of uncovering something that's a problem in your home that you didn't realize. 
um, that you don't get to until you get to do a retrofit. And upstairs, what those walls were, well, partition board, and that meant um, they really were going to be a bit difficult to to do anything about because of the way that they junction with the loft. <clears throat> All the windows were old, cold UPVC with with cold spaces. They were kind of ten to fifteen years old, uh, probably more actually. No, more like fifteen to twenty years old when we when we were doing this. Uh, and so having done all these investigations, it was time to it's time to make some decisions. And I really feel like until you've done a lot of investigations, it's 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 not really possible to make informed decisions. Um, but of course, those decisions are also informed by budget uh, and your drivers. So so why it is that you want to do the retrofit? And for us, it was definitely a bit of modernization, uh, those potential other opportunities, um, lowering performance, increasing increasing comfort. Uh, and air quality within in an urban setting. Um, and we, I used an assessment process at the time to model some different options to see, you know, where I might be able to get the best results um, for the amount of money that I'd spent. Um, I can tell you a little bit about this, 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 and I'll tell you about, about the budget at the end, actually, and you get to see what, what, what we did. <clears throat> so all of this sort of kind of governing approach which I think is it, it's important to sort of bear in mind is it's really important not to go into this process um, full tilt. To have a very clear plan that that has some flexibility in it. Um, but to be very clear about what it is you're doing and why it is you're doing it, because otherwise you can get into a bit of a muddle. So the approach that we took was that we were definitely going to go to deep. And the reason we were going to go deep was because it had become clear that in order to go forward with the construction that we'd investigated and found, it, it was going to be possibly a waste of time and money to do anything else but go deep on this house. It, it, it just trying to paper over the cracks really wouldn't have really wouldn't have cut it. So in this case, I think we had originally sort of toyed with the idea of not really doing very much. Um, but it, it became clear that if we you know we just sort of treated the, the cavity walls with external wall insulation or something, we'd be leaving massive problems um, uh, and that we wouldn't really get much gain for it. Um, so, yeah, but we decided to do this budget. We didn't want to make it a flashy house, although, you know, like I said, it was it was in an up and coming area. Um, that meant that there was quite a bit of equity in the house. So um, what what my wife had paid for it, it was already worth significantly more than. So, but we certainly didn't want to be spending more than that um, on it, really. So there was an emphasis on, yeah, quality over kind of um, kind of flamboyance in any kind of way. Given that we were going to go and go deep, we would be replacing almost everything. We wanted to try and retain whatever was possible um, and pragmatic to do. Um, Partly just to keep the budget down, but also just because of the you know the sheer waste of stuff getting getting thrown away and the kind of the, the cost of that, but also the, the 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 carbon cost of it. We wanted to maximise the use of space. It was already a very small space, but we were planning a family. Um, we knew we weren't going to stay in Manchester for forever, um, so you know we were kind of another reason for not spending too much money on it was that we we want we knew that we would. Um, not be living it wasn't our forever home so there wasn't a there was no point in, pl in plowing a, a huge amount of money or borrowing a lot of money to go put into it uh and material choices were based mostly on cost and performance rather than on the ethics which i think maybe would have informed my choice a little bit more later down the line because it was going deep we realized that it needed a full replumb and a rewire and it, it kind of needed those anyway it was on microbore um at this time, 2014, I certainly wasn't thinking about a heat pump. We were on the mains gas grid. Gas was like ridiculously cheap. I've just been looking at some of the bills from, from before this now. It's it's quite remarkable. <laughs> the cost of electricity then it was like 11p and standing charges were six and a half p a day. Um, it's really quite remarkable to see how far it's come in what is a relatively short period of time. So having decided to go deep, this this is the bit where people start uh, potentially start to lose people, <clears throat> and I you know I really get that this this level of intervention is not for anybody everybody. In fact, it's only for a very few. So I want to try and make this presentation as um, 
as applicable as possible, bearing in mind there is a case study of this particular house and this is what we did. Um, so, you know, we, we knew that we wanted to get to the bottom of everything and we did decide that we wanted to heat, we, we wanted to do the floor and doing the floor meant having investigated how deep the floor was and whether the footing footings would be able to withstand um, uh, a full dig out, which it turned out they did. Uh, and then we got this mini digger in, drove in through the front door, took a day to break it out. That's the that, that bottom picture. You can see the, the rubble of the front of the of the whole of the floor in the house on the front drive got taken away. Obviously, all the kitchen came out. Um, some of the other things here, like the staircase was one of those things that was really in an inconvenient. It would have made it an inconvenient job. And um, actually, one thing I haven't thought to put in here, which I really meant to, is that the team that I had working on me. These were not people who'd done any retrofit at all before. In fact, this guy here you can see in this picture here is probably one of the least handy people I've ever met. Um, but he he was very careful. And so some of the some of the skills that he brought to to the job his care and attention to detail were really invaluable. I did happen to know a very experienced, good quality um, joiner carpenter with some site skills and some site management experience. And so sort of together we project managed the job. And then the rest of it, apart from one or two specialist tasks, um, was just done with relatively cheap labor that was just well directed. Um, yeah, so some of the other things we found, this sort of shows the whole sort of hell downstairs of the house. This is this doorway on the right hand side here, which gave the structural engineer heebie jeebies because it was effectively this wall is what pins the two outside walls together in the middle of the house and with these two openings in it, it he felt that was really compromised so we we blocked that out it actually hadn't been used it wasn't there so we'd we blocked that up uh this one here shows one of the ceiling joists I, i'm not sure if you can really see but it was really remarkably bowed um and which had led to a bulge in the ceiling which we'd previously thought had been somebody putting their foot through the through the loft but it turned out no it was it must have been some joist that had bent over time uh, probably when the house was just built and then the upstairs uh, it's, it's really kind of remarkable this bottom right picture is quite remarkable to think that that uh, you can kind of see the layout of the rooms there on the floor there were three bedrooms a landing a bathroom and a toilet in that space um and all those walls just came out they weren't supporting the roof in any way and actually it was such a clever layout that there was really no other way to do it that would make sense um the rooms had like a you can sort of see this gray patch on the floor here, I hope, which was a cupboard. So so the, the there's three bedrooms, they had cupboards between them. So the kind of the walls were almost a bit thicker that gave a little bit of deadening, but also, you know, structurally probably kept a kept the whole thing quite solid. So then on to the measures that we did um, the floor after we dug it out, um, it didn't have to have concrete go back in. Uh, the, the building control officer they usually go for that but he was he was quite he was quite okay without it doing um but we did put a damp proof membrane in and then that damp proof membrane had to be joined into the to the wall which is here the floor is then fully insulated um with this king span and then one of the specialist guys i got in was just a, a local screening company that they came in for them it was a very small job did it on a saturday morning guy was wearing his i think he was wearing his daughter's socks they had he had odd socks on one of them had kind of pink flowers on it i always like to think that he was wearing his daughter's socks because otherwise that seemed very out of character but um yeah for him it was just a quick a cheap bit of saturday morning cash i think really um and then in the end we went in the lounge for a reclaimed parquet flooring which i i wouldn't really recommend to anybody it was a labor of love there were although we went for a budget there was just one or two items that we you know we chose to kind of put a little bit of effort in and that was that was one of them it was relatively cheap to buy the material but um the labor cost in kind of scraping the bitumen off the back um and just the pain and 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 difficulty of doing that was was quite quite extraordinary um the walls we like i said we we, we i did look at ewi and i didn't know a lot about cavity wall treatment at the time but it seemed like it would be keep a lot of it would be out of keeping with the rest of the the rest of the area. 
And at that time, it felt like a much more expensive option. So I decided to go with um, quite a thick IWI solution, which I, I might not be advised to do these days to have a lot of discussions about cavity walls. But I used, still being quite new to this, I used a critical friend, basically, as a, as a way of testing stuff out. A guy called Nick Parsons in, in Sheffield, who very, very long experienced retrofit sort of consultant, very pragmatic guy. Um, and because it was my own house, I was able to take perhaps take risks that you might you might not take if you were doing it for somebody else. I don't think they were high level risks. They were just. Yeah, it, it wasn't necessarily playing it by the book. It was really thinking everything through and making um, making pragmatic solutions, accepting there was some risk and doing everything that was possible to mitigate those risks. So the walls were parged first, so they were stripped first and then reparged for air tightness with a lime plaster so that they, they, there was still some potential for breathing. And then PIR insulation bonded onto them, carefully bonded on, not like dot and dab, like this sort of stuff is done generally, so that there was no air movement behind the boards. The boards are then taped. The front walls, all that loose block work which was serving no purpose apart from just being, you know, it, it served no thermal purpose, was replaced with timber frame that was filled with mineral wool. And then outside that was a breathable wood fiber board. And on the inside, again, there was some PIR insulation to try and get the same level of performance in the front and back walls as there was in the side. Um, and then ultimately it was all rendered. I think I've got a picture of it rendered later. The ceiling was very, in most ways, mostly very conventional, I managed to keep the insulation that had been in there. Um, the only difficulty was at the eaves where there was a, a much reduced sort of uh, headroom for things. So we put some PIR in at the edges and this sort of shows the kind of detail of shaped boards that I had to put in. Um, the kind of fiddly thing that a uh, perhaps a jobbing builder or a kind of mass scale builder is never going to do, but the sort of thing that if you're doing your own build, um, it, it actually doesn't take that long on a small, you know, on a single house uh, and the care and attention to detail that you can put in, it means that you'll get much, much better performance results. Um, once the ceiling had been complete, then uh, a full sort of intelligent airtight membrane, taped airtight membrane was put in underneath it. And then a batten and a, and a plasterboard ceiling put in uh, to provide a service void. And the same was true of the walls as a service void. So all the services, the plumbing and the electrics were inside of the air tightness layer and the thermal uh, insulation layer so that none of the services needed or as few as, as possible, the services needed to penetrate any of those. We did decide to go to for MVHR and that was sort of a, something that probably wouldn't have happened if we hadn't gone as deep. It was more of a question of, well, if we're going to have to go deep because of the construction, then that makes MVHR a possibility. But I did go for a, you know what was a relatively cheap um, version of that. Um, and I scratched around and, and found things that I could. I found this this unit it was they were about two thousand pounds at the time, and I found one new in the box, hadn't been used for a thousand pounds from somebody. And I did that with quite a lot of things. I kind of I just hunted around to try and make best use of the budget that I had. Trying to imagine where the routing was going to go, even once the house had been stripped out, was quite challenging. How are we doing for time? Um, and as you can see, it was kind of, I think this photograph is called the octopus. Um, and I, I had to build out some bulkheads. This is the inside the kitchen here at the top left photograph. And we built out some bulkheads, um, which, yeah, once you moved in, you, you wouldn't really notice that that's what was there, but they were hiding this sort of snaking. And upstairs, I had to do something that, that one of those cupboards between the two rooms, I lifted the floor of that so that some ducts could run uh, perpendicular to the joists um, in a kind of hidden way. But again, living in the house, you'd never know it was there. Um, and then because the, the vents for the ducts needed to be as far away from the doorways as possible, this bottom left hand corner picture, you can see we kind of made fake sloping ceilings in the rooms, which many houses do have. Um, to sort of hide the hide the duct um, so that we could get it right over into the corner. The heating, yeah, we, we were taking out an old combi boiler. Um, 
I wanted to make use of spare PV in the summer. So that meant having a tank. So that meant having a system boiler. Um, and there was an opportunity because we'd done the floor to have underfloor heating downstairs. That's a picture down there of the, the underfloor heating layout. It wasn't hard to do. It was, yeah, it, it wasn't a specialist job really. Um, I got yeah. the, the plumbing done later, uh, plumbing in done later by, you know, by a professional. Um, I did go for a quite a complicated Honeywell um, control system. Um, and I was, I was even there at that time, I was aware of how important the air tightness was going to be. So we we're trying to drive that as low as possible. And that meant considering it in everything that we did. Um, there were some challenging areas. It's in the top left here, you can see the steel uh, running across the top of the window where the joists were poked into there. So somehow an, an air tightness layer is going to have to be done now. That meant wrapping all the joists and then building these details. Again, it's finickety work, um, but it actually doesn't take that long. It's just fiddly. It needs somebody will take care over it once it's explained to them and do it. Um, and then we used a, a non-intelligent, a, a plastic membrane on the walls because internally they weren't breathable anyway. And so that was a cheap option. And then where services, this is the MVHR and the soil stacks and the, and the boiler flue where they did penetrate the, 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 um, the envelope, they're all grommeted and, and taped to make sure those were airtight. The windows was one of those, uh, was a very pragmatic solution. I, the, the downstairs windows uh, in the front were going to have to change because we were changing the layout a little bit. You can see this small window on the left-hand side. That was downstairs toilet and the utility room where previously there'd been a single large window across, and that was the kitchen window. And we were changing the porch a bit. And on the back, there was a similar arrangement to this, but um, it was performing very badly. It was leaking very badly and sagging quite badly. So downstairs, we had new triple glazed UPVC windows put in and I tried to get as good a performance as I could out of them but it was off a very local bog standard supplier so it was standard frames with UPVC units put into them uh, sorry with triple glazed units put into them upstairs I kept all the, the original frames um, and just had them reglazed so we had them reglazed with with warm spaces so the window budget was really relatively inexpensive as, as a full part of the budget compared to a lot of modern deep retrofits. In fact, you know, very much so. Here you can see the, uh, that, that downstairs window completely removed and upstairs above it, you can see how that block wall has been replaced by timber. It's not quite possible to see, but there was always like a, there was a steel across the top here and then a timber across the top and two timbers that ran that kind of, supported that between and they were retained and the other stud work put in um, and here's just a little thermal image of how the structural steel in these in these windows here um, showed up as cold even after we'd had them done and the handles showed up as cold so you know they were triple glazed windows and they were probably better than double glazed windows but they were still upvc windows and they you know they're not the best performance um, and they probably over time they you know they will they will tire more quickly than than solid timber. Oh, this little picture at the bottom as well is once we'd had it fitted, I realised if I looked down the bottom of the door, I could see outside, and um, yeah, I didn't really think that. Even I don't think that met the kind of air tightness class that they were kind of claiming for their windows mm. anyway. If you could actually see through it, um, we had to come up with a little fix for that. So the results, uh, we got the air tightness down to 0.75. Um, which is better than Enerfit. Um, and I was quite, like I said, I was quite new to air testing at the time. And, and I remember coming over to do it one evening and then doing it and thinking, I can't have got this right. That can't, it can't possibly be that good. And then coming back and doing it again and doing it again. And be like, no, it really is that good. And what that showed to me is that it is possible to get this right just with care. You don't have to go completely. I mean, it's a deep retrofit, but you don't have to go completely mad with the products. You just need to take care and think about what you're doing at every stage. When we were living there, the gas consumption reduced by 70% to about three and a half thousand kilowatt hours a year, a year. After the PV had put, put in, we got the electricity down to a thousand kilowatt hours. But we were very, you know, we were very aware of our energy use. We'd made a green home and we weren't going to mean that that um, meant that we were going to sort of splash out. We were, you know, well, I was in particular, 
um, still very conscious of our energy use. So we drove it as low as we could. Um, but we did have the heating time to come on for much longer. Um, so the house was a comfortable 20 degrees most of the time. And here you can see the, the heating controller um, showing that the temperature in the house in October with most of the heating off is all around 20 degrees. Um, so we got a huge comfort benefit, a huge comfort benefit. It was it was a very comfortable house to live in. Um, and one thing that I hadn't reckoned on was the improvement in air quality uh, and the effect that I had on which I'd had on I'd, I'd had previously a, uh, a quite a severe allerg allergic reaction, particularly in the heating season to dust, animal fur, um, kind of the normal things. Um, and uh, every year I'd get I'd get very, very bad. Um, and I had done all my life. Uh, and within six months, nine months of, of living in this house, that ceased and nearly 10 years later it's it's not come back and it doesn't matter now I can go I can go to a house full of cats and rabbits and I can go to a dusty house and I can go to a house that's heated conventionally and doesn't have good air quality and and that's um I, I sort of consider that my nasal membranes in some way were, were repaired through this process having previously always been under stress so completely unforeseen consequence up in the top right here you can see the filters for the MVHR the top one here on the, the one on the right here is a clean one the top one is the air being extracted and that is basically skin uh, the bottom one is um, the air that's coming in and that is basically traffic soot um, i suppose mostly in manchester and that's over like probably three or four months so that's the air that's inside your home and that's the air that you're bringing inside your home uh, and and we'd you know, we'd updated the home, so it was a home for the future. Now it was it was ready for the future, and it had had a complete revamp. It had a new kitchen, although a mod a very modest kitchen. My mum very kindly uh, gave me a present of a of the, the money for a sort of nice stone worktop as a bit of a treat. But you know, it was a it's a lovely little family home that should be ready for another fifty, you know, fifty hundred years life. Um, and and be comfortable to live in and affordable to live in um we when we moved down to hereford my wife having had this house for a long time was very attached to it and so we wanted to hang on to it she she dreams that one day we'll go back and live there when we're too old to live in in rural herefordshire in this big this big place um and we rented out to some young friends for a year and and they used even less energy than we did because they were even more conscious than we were and then it went on to the general market and i asked the estate agents if they would look out for some sort of green conscious conscious tenants but i honestly don't think they took any notice of me um and, and they took on the first clients who came along and when i first went to visit um i walked into the place and it was about 25 degrees um a couple were living there with their twin daughters uh, and, and the, the mum in the house was jamaican she, she liked it very warm um and uh you know i was i was a bit i was a bit shocked about how much energy was going to be moved to being having been become a bit of a purist and uh and but, but one of the daughters was uh, a very profound learning dif difficulties um was autistic but also had as a result of some of this these complications really really bad asthma uh, that traditionally when they'd lived in a home if they weren't really super careful she'd get triggered by the slightest bit of damp or mould and would then end up in hospital for three months. She had a special bed that she had to be in that kind of kept her upright. And so the mum sort of said to me that, you know, this house was just an utter blessing to them because um, it meant that they, they didn't have to worry too much about that. And that was October 2019, and they're still there now. Uh, and and they are much higher energy users than we were Um but I like to think actually that it's still a good thing that the house is 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 what it's like. But partly because it it means that she can have the comfort that she enjoys. Uh, her daughter is is safe, um, and if they lived in another type of home, they'd be using even more energy than we would if we were living in that other type of home. If that makes sense. What do we learn? I was aware that that large window at the back could probably lead to overheating, but I conveniently kind of ignored it and thought I'd do something about it later if I needed to. It turned out to be true uh, in the summer. 
that back room gets very warm and I still haven't got around to do anything about it. Even for these poor tenants, they put a bit of a gazebo out the back. Um, the MVHR, I really cut the corners on it. I didn't put any sound attenuation into it really. And I could hear it in some of the rooms. Um, didn't bother my wife. Nobody else seemed to notice it, but it bothered me. I have later put a little bit in. The heating controls were wildly overcomplicated, completely unnecessary for a house that you want to keep roughly the same temperature everywhere. One thermostat and and a simple timer is perfectly adequate. Complicated timing timing and, and temperature settings only really lead to inefficiency and, um, and potential breakdown. Um, they often kind of, they're, they're novel for a while and people play around with them, but eventually you probably settle back into something that's not that dissimilar from from what you would have done anyway and in a highly insulated home there really is no need for for, for a great deal of zoning uh, i also learned that what you don't do tends not to get done uh, especially if you're just about a hammer family predictably like part way through this build we we got pregnant um as one does um here's a little chap there investigating the washing machine in the new utility room downstairs um we did do some some later things, um, but there are still things there that I, you know, I probably could have done at the time. Uh, I wouldn't put reclaimed flooring onto underfloor heating again. It even though it was very dry when we put it in, it still shrunk um, uh, and became a bit knocky. Uh, and yeah, I also learned that there's always something that you can do different. You know, it's never going to be perfect. There's always there's always something you go back to. But generally speaking, given the inexperience I had, the inexperience of the team that we put into it, and the fact that I mean, it, it, it will sound like a lot of money to some people, but in the scale of like I'm working on some rich fits at the moment, with which are probably more modest than this, we spent seventy five thousand pounds doing this, and that included everything down to the coffees around the corner from the, my wife insisted on budgeting for everything it didn't include my time uh, which would have been not insignificant but it did include renting the house over the road for example um and 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 now you you, you wouldn't get anything like that for that but so much benefit so much cost saving was done from learning myself and doing myself um uh, and I think ultimately a better quality job was done as well. And I learned so much for me, for myself going forward to help others. What we got next, uh, I will deal with that overshading. I have looked into it. It's a, a, just a case in point, actually. I, I went out to a company to find out how much it was going to cost for them to put a, you know, a fairly br simple brise layer across the back. And it was six or seven thousand um, pounds. And that was just to supply it. I'd have had to fit it myself, which just goes to show how much things are changed in cost uh, the boiler is now 10 years old will be this year and i think probably i might try and get the heat pump in um before the end of the um boiler upgrade scheme uh i realize i want to go back to the tenants and find out how their what their experience is like of it you know to what extent they're aware of the energy they're using whether they're making best use of um still you know how they're how they're using the timers and whether they know that they're or they've remembered that their hot water can be provided entirely by the sun in the summer or whether they're still using the gas boiler for that because they're non-expert. And so some more tenant engagement is probably is probably a wise thing. Uh, and next time round, I'll probably make some better manuals for the for the tenants um, uh, and how to use the place, you know, to, to keep their costs down as much as possible. We did clad the porch you can see a little picture there you can see the the, the the clad was porch later that was a job we did get around to and I extended the garage out to the back to just a very slight amount just to to make a workshop for myself make a little bit more space um but other than that like i say i don't think there's really a lot that needs doing to it the tenants when they first came in i i remember i had some monitoring set up uh that was on the wi-fi so i asked them if they could sort of plug it into their router and and he said oh uh Oh no, we don't have a phone router anymore. We got um, we got cable put in, <laughs> so they'd invited one of the cable providers to come along and drill a massive hole through my nice air tightness layer uh, without asking me. So like, we had a very polite conversation about how I would really like to know about these things before they were done. And um, but it, you know, it is a case in point that somebody coming into a house like this won't won't have any clue really. 
about what's important about it. Um, so I, yeah, I did want to sort of touch on on cavity wall properties because it's a bit of a pet subject of mine at the moment, and I'm actually doing a webinar for the ACB uh, at the beginning of next month um, with a, with a high focus on it because it's something we come across. I, I starting my work in Manchester, I really focused most heavily on solid wall properties actually because there's so much Victorian terracing and and semi detached up there, but increasingly I'm coming across people with cavities. And they are actually quite problematic. Um, they're they're not as simple as solid wall a solid wall property. Solid wall properties are hard to treat, and they've got certain moisture risks. But they are quite simple. It's just a big chunk of of, of masonry. Cavity walls come in many many different types with many many nuances. Um, they can be partially filled. They can have been they can have been built empty and then laterally filled. They can have been built partially filled. They can have been built partially filled and vented partially filled and unvented uh, and it's really not until you find out what kind of property you've got that that you know what you're dealing with and i'm dealing with a property in crick owl at the moment where the original house it turned out and not until we did an investigation at the point of assessment turned out it was a timber frame house with brick cladding when he thought he lived in a in a masonry clad home and it had two cavity wall extensions of different types and different ages put onto it. So in dealing with that home, we've got to deal with three different types of cavity, one of which the cavity, because of the extension, runs through the middle of the house and it's it's creating an awful lot of problems. And if we'd just done a light touch on it, um, we'd have left a huge problem and he probably would have suffered some really severe consequences of having this open cavity running through um, this house. They really wouldn't have gained the performance that you'd expect. Um, and then there's some inherent bridging problems with with uh with cavity walls depending on kind of the age they are and the way that they're built um but there does this although there's some rule of thumbs there really are an awful lot of exceptions mostly houses built of the age of the place we're talking at in manchester and before that the way they closed off the cavities at the openings with some masonry so there are a lot of thermal bridges around the outside of the windows and the doors um but then i'm working on a house in swansea at the moment where so the, the cavities were closed with um, uh, lath and plaster. So there are there are no hard and fast rules. And until you know what you've got in your situation, then it really isn't possible to know how to treat it. Um, yeah, the cavities are not well filled. Uh, even now, if you see somebody building a, a cavity wall house and you look at the way that the insulation is being put into the cavity, uh, the potential for thermal bypass and for bridging is still very very extreme and it goes part way to uh, to explain the kind of thermal performance gap that we see in uh, even in you know the newest houses so they do often need careful thought um and and because of this as it's, i'll show you on the next slide but because of this we're tending to recommend i do i iwi and if we if we have to come up with a kind of one solution fits all it's starting to look like if you want to improve a cavity wall internal wall insulation is probably the safest the safest go-to and that EWI uh, is possibly pointless to an extent, uh, certainly um, problematic to get done right. And I've seen many examples of EWI being done on cavity walls without thought given to some of the details. Um, and yeah, if you, if you want to look up, if you're interested in cavity walls a little bit and you want to look up, you should be able to find out on the ACB website, so the webinar that's for next month. But just quickly looking at it, um, some of the reasons why cavity details, I don't know to what extent you can see uh, see this, but this just shows like a typical potential cavity wall. So the cavity might be, this would be the outside brick, this would be the inside block, here's the joist from inside a house and a socket. If you put external wall insulation on it, but the, ca the cavity is vented, then there's the potential for air to get behind your external wall insulation and making it, rendering it completely pointless. Um, because in modern days, what they do is dot and dab plasterboard onto unrendered block on the internal wall. And because the joists and other things run through that internal wall, there's a gap in the gaps into the cavity and air gets through into the cavity through the joists, gets in behind the plasterboard, comes out round sockets. And when I'm doing air tests, I see this all the time in modern cavity walls. Air leaks through sockets, between the floors, under skirting boards. Um, and goes right across the house and and it's an extremely difficult area to treat because a lot of it comes from 
stuff that you can't do without taking the plasterboard off or removing parts of the floor or the ceiling to get at the intermediate floor void. And then another inherent problem on the right hand side here in cavity wall properties is that the internal leaf is usually the structural one. Although again, I've seen exceptions to that recently. Um, so the, the ceiling um, is supported on the internal wall and the roof overhangs it. So the outer leaf is really effectively a kind of, it's, it's a kind of a cladding um, and doesn't reach up as high as the internal leaf. Uh, and often, especially when they're retrospectively filled, that fill settles. Uh, and so there's a region on the inside at the very top on the upstairs floor, which is totally uninsulated. And in order to insulate it, any external wall insulation would have to rise up over the top of that wall and then somehow join up with any insulation in the loft with, to, to not leave very serious cold bridges and air tightness issues in the corner. And that often means taking back tiles um, or, or redoing roofs. So external wall insulation um, detailed properly to avoid these problems means an awful lot of an awful lot of extra work. And what I see from people who are looking to do EWI on their cavity home is they'll get a company to come out and they'll get a quote, which is usually driven by price, uh, you know, competitively by price. So I see people having quotes for EWI on cavity wall houses, which really seem relatively, relatively inexpensive, although still, you know, multiple tens of thousands of pounds. But the reality is that they're just going to stop at all the edges. They'll miss detailing of drain pipes, of bay roofs. Um, yeah, many, many details. This detail here, sometimes, you know, meter cupboards, whatever else is fixed to the outside of the house. And they'll stop at the DPC. So there'll be a big thermal bridge around the floor. Uh, and with all those additional works, uh, it easily can double the cost of doing the EWI. Um, and... Obviously, for most householders, they don't they, they're not aware of that. I'm dealing with a job in Gower at the moment where the company recommended they extract the cavity wall insulation because they had wet walls, um, although it didn't really give them any answers to why the, the walls might be wet. And then when the tenant said or the, the occupiers said that they wanted the walls re-rendered, but they were concerned about the lack of insulation, the company said that they very happily externally insulated it. And although they sort of functionally do good at good job it's detailed appallingly the, the it ends at the soffits there's massive cold thermal bridges it's it sort of misses out around the drain pipes and here and there and everything but crucially they've left the cavity empty because of the damp issues um and the cavity is vented into the loft and the air tightness into the house is very poor so the ewi that they spent 10 or twenty thousand pounds having added onto their how their problematic house is doing almost nothing so it does really require a lot of care and I, you know, I really don't want to scare you, but I also do want to make sure that people take care to to investigate what they've got uh, and, and challenge and question when they're offered something. And that's it. That was less than an hour. Fantastic. So it's kind of open to any Thank questions. You, now. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Um, question time coming up. So if you want to be popping them into the chat um, and Tony will be picking those up, that will be excellent. Um, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, yeah, I was particularly astounded, really, your level of air tightness that you got to. That's amazing. Um, yes, yeah, so that was I. That's goals. <laughs> Let's see how we get on. Um, yeah, and really intriguing. The, the health benefits, not really something we talk about or think about too much when we're thinking about retrofit. It's more about the cost saving and energy saving, but we are really huge from that MBHR. So that was really fascinating. I think another to say thing to say about that, there's something that we say is it's not just the health of the occupant, although that is very important, um, but also the health of the building because keeping houses cold, which is what we traditionally do if we're not using rooms. You know, I, I quite often go to assessments. I went to an assessment last year in Nottingham a uh, lady living in a house on her own and the rooms that she wasn't in were at nine degrees or at 10 degrees. Um, it increases the massively increases the potential for condensation, um, uh, you know, for, for people, for elderly people living in, in those kind of temperatures. Um, I mean, for her, she was um, recovering from cancer and it was causing her complications living so cold, mm. but she just couldn't afford to live any warmer. So, yeah, the, the health benefits both to the building and to the occupant are are certainly not to be sniffed at. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And and again, the, the behaviours as well. Really interesting seeing that reflection of how different tenants have used the property. Sure. I think that's probably, yeah. again, something that isn't often thought about. But anyway, over to the questions. Tony, are you there? I hope so. You are. Am I here? Um, Gervais, you won't be surprised here. We've had we've had a lot of questions. We could just cover what you've just finished with all over again. Uh, lots of questions about uh, cavity walls and what's the best way to go about. Um, in, in this particular instance, then, sorry, I didn't pick it up in your talk. Did So the two cavity walls that were already there, that were already filled, did you leave, you left them alone, did you? Uh, they They had internal wall insulation on them. But the cavity itself, you left. The cavity it. was left untouched. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> um, yes. The, so about external wall insulation, the question I, um, well, the the word I used was the same as yours. It was pointless. Um, so it doesn't have to be. I've done mm. it here. I've externally insulated a cavity here very effectively, but. Um, it wasn't easy, you know, it was complicated. I was doing a re-roof at the same time. So it afforded the possibility to to make sure that absolutely everything that had to be done was done. Um, Does that include, so closing, sealing off the cavity? Exactly, yeah, and topping it up. So um, if we go back to this, I don't know how well you can see these drawings, but yeah, where the, where the fill in the cavity didn't reach the top, I, I closed it off with a membrane in the in the rafters and then got a polystyrene bead to come company to come in and, and top up top it up so that was continuous insulation in the in the gap. But I was doing a re-roof anyway, so it was I mean, you know, as part of the job I was doing a re-roof. Um, the job I'm doing in Krakow, uh, sorry, in Swansea, um, he sort of came to me because he'd imagined doing EWI, but he was starting to realise it was going to be a problem. And and really the work that I've done for him is to for us to kind of bottom out what you know what was going to be the most pragmatic thing for his builder as well his builder like had very little experience in in retrofit and so what was going to be possible for him to do and when we started to look at you know they weren't having a re-roof they could have pulled like the bottom four rails of tiles off for example it would would have been possible to do that um you know it's a bit of a faff but it's you know it's not it's not the end of the world they weren't slates which are particularly difficult to put back on again but it was going to involve quite a lot of tricky detailing and for a builder who you know is perhaps a little bit more mainstream it would it, we couldn't really couldn't see him pulling off the kind of attention to detail that would be necessary to to do it and and that kind of swung it onto it and onto iwi so we went ended up going that way there Okay, um, so where going back to your house again, where the um, the cavity needs closing um, after the house has been built, is it possible to do that? Do you have to take off some of the roof to get at it? Yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, in um, the case of this house, uh, if you're doing EWI, this is yeah. yeah. Um, it, it 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 does depend a little bit. Um. I can see there might be possibilities to kind of get a very small boy into a loft and kind of get them to sort of reach down. Again, you can't really give a generalized rule, but I would say probably in most cases, it, it's necessary to pull some tiles back in order to get, well, we're only talking about the eaves really. The the gable ends are a little bit, a little bit different because it's right up the top, but ideally you want to be, you want to be making sure that cavity is filled it's either fully filled or and preferably to capped or if it's not fully filled then then capped off if you're going to put ewi on right okay so we had a question um <clears throat> with the, the the picture here on the left hand side where it's partially filled um yeah. so presumably the best thing to do in that situation is to clear the cavity get rid of that partial fill fill it up with modern bead insulation um well, and cap it if possible as well. So typically that partial fill will be either rock wall bats or PIR boards. So it's not possible to remove it. Right. Um, it is possible to get, if, if the cavity, the remaining cavity, which is usually 50 to 60 millimeters, it is usually possible. And I have had companies quote to fill the rest of it with, with polystyrene bead. 
Um, if you're going to do EWI, then that is an option because the venting of the cavity won't become so necessary um, because it's weather protected. So the issue with this is that um, your outside leaf of wall is going to be is prone to depending on your depending on the exposure. So how much rain, basically how much rain is hitting it. The wall will at times get quite wet. Um, and <clears throat> what, what they only recently discovered was that the action of the sun on a wall that has got wet in it pushes, it drives the wetness further into the further into the masonry. And because the wall is potentially very cold, um, that that can lead to frosting. <clears throat> so they vent the cavity to stop that wall, that moisture from from traversing the cavity and getting onto your inner leaf. So if you're weather protected, and one way to do this if you if you don't, if you're not having render on the outside, is that something called a brick cream, which is a kind of breathable, porous cream that kind of actually means that water can't penetrate, but but vapor can get through. Or if you're EW wiring it, then the the, the weather the weather is um the weatherization is done with that, or it's rendered then the weatherization is done with that. The only other thing to be a little bit careful of is what's going on down the bottom, because if the walls are getting wet and the DPCs aren't good, then, then, you know, there will be, um, can be water bridging issues down the bottom. You need a cavity wall survey basically before you do anything. Okay. Um, <clears throat> brutal question uh, where we have um, internal wall insulation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not entirely sure what you finished it with, but how do you hang up pictures and, um, put screws into the wall yeah so um was that battens was it yeah it's so that you see this picture down here this is battened so the battens go through the internal wall insulation into the masonry wall i won't tell you what a fiddly lovely fiddly job we did of that the guy that i was working with was like you're doing what literally drilled a hole squirted some silicon into it and then drove the screw in you know so that you kind of the air tightness was maintained um, there was three of us doing it, one with the Hoover, one with a silicon gun and one with a screwdriver. And then, yeah, plasterboard. Actually, we filled between these battens with another bit of insulation, a little thin bit of insulation, which I had to route out for the services. Um, and then, yeah, plasterboard over the top of it. And yeah, so so there's 25 mil behind the plasterboard, which hopefully means that, you know, you're not going to drive something through the air tightness layer, which is the which is the plastic there. Okay. Um, question from Jackie. If you were doing the same work today, would you use all the same insulation materials? Depend on the budget, I suppose. Say so again? Depend on the budget. Um, I think I probably would use a breathable wall insulation now. And I don't think I'd go to the thickness that I would. I think I'd feel... That this was a little bit risky although like i said nick and i talked it through uh, i think i even had woofies done in some places so woofy is a kind of thermal is a moisture modeling um software and i had some done some done on it and some risk was shown but i know on the clr so on the acb's carbon light retrofit course i had quite i was just i did that actually just after we did this house and um, I had quite strong conversations with andy and and Tim Martell about <laughs> the approach that I'd taken I'm still happy with it uh, in my house, would I still do this again? If yeah, if the budget, yeah, the budget and ease. I mean, that stuff you can just, I, you know, you can go down, go down the road and buy it. Whereas wood fiber, it's a lot more expensive and it's more difficult to get hold of. Um, it's heavier, but I probably would prefer to go with a wood fiber solution now. Um, okay. Um, another question about internal wall insulation. A uh, very good point from Bridget. Um, we've had internal wall insulation in some of our rooms, but to do it in the kitchen and the bathroom would mean, presumably, removing cupboards, sinks, boilers, etc., on the external walls. So, I'm afraid yes, you're, Bridget, you're correct. Bridget. <laughs> yeah. Yes, is the answer. Yeah, it, it's it's not really possible. It's not really possible without um, stripping stuff back. Inconvenient. Okay. Um, does the original lime plaster on the walls already act as an air tightness layer, or should a membrane be added on top before IWI is added? Um, this is somebody talking about something that they've got with a lime plaster, or presumably, yeah, a solid wall house. Um, missing. Um, 
it, it again it's a bit of a depends and this is a little bit what, what this place in swansea this is what i've come come to and i had a woofy done with that so they've actually gone for a parge coat on the internal wall which is what i did here and i did this in lime to create a bit of a breathing although i'm not really sure that that was necessary that was nick's idea um that that whatever that original is, if you're thinking about it as your air tightness layer, it it needs to be very tight. So if it's original lime, I'd suggest that uh, you need to go around and checking quite a lot and making sure stuff wasn't loose and and where it was patching it up because if that is your air tightness layer, I think it's right, um, gen generally further, bad. Go on. Sorry, Jabez. There's a further comment which it's a 1950s building. I'm not sure if that would be lime. Seems unlikely, but you know you never know. Um, can you explain quickly what a parge coat is? What do you mean? By uh, it's just a rough coat of render. Um, it's just sort of like a covering coat. You know, it's sort of nothing, nothing fancy really. Um, let's see if I can see here. So that, that creates the airtightness layer. Well, in this house, no, it wasn't. But you, you wouldn't. So you've got you've got wind tightness, and this is particularly true for cavities, right? Um, let's see, look at the cavity. Personally, I prefer to have my air tightness layer on the inside where I can get at it. And, um, and it, it just feels like the air tightness on the inside of your box feels like the most sensible place to have it, but it, it, it doesn't have to be there. And one of one reason for having it on the outside so you just have to bear with me a little bit here. And I know Andy Simmons, for example, has done quite a few projects recently where the air tightness layer is on the outside <clears throat> is because whatever insulation that you have between that internal air tightness layer and the outside must also not be subject to the cold air from outside getting into it and passing through it. That's thermal bypass. So it's not necessarily the air that's moving from the inside of the house to the outside or from the outside to the inside of the house. It's more what potential is there for cold air to move through the insulation layers that you've got and strip out the warmer air from nearer, nearer to the inside of the house. So having a parge coat is not exactly an air tightness layer, but if you've got internal wall insulation inside of that, you don't want uh, air coming through the loose unrendered block work underneath and then getting through your insulation and, and taking out the warm, potentially taking out the warm air. So you really want to sort of think about keeping it. We call it wind tight and air tight you know, on timber frame buildings. That's what they do. They make the outside wind tight and they make the inside air tight. Um, but that's the principle you're trying to get at. And this is the problem with these modern cavity walls is the internal block is not rendered and they just dot and dab the plasterboard on. So, because it's unseen there are often perps and beds on the on the block work that aren't complete and then the cavities are ventilated and the insulation isn't quite up to it and the world ties come through so there's many places where air can move from into the cavity uh, through that and behind the plasterboard which is rendering that in that insulation in the cavity pointless or to some degree and people mm -hmm. have done studies on this mark siddle <clears throat> from the acb has published a paper and did a whole talk on on thermal bypass uh, even from actually the what what you often see with cavity wall um especially rigid board cavity wall insulation is that it's not really quite touching that inner leaf everywhere now they have a kind of there's a fixing that kind of fix it they build the internal block first and then they fix the board to the outside face of that with these kind of screwy pin things but, you know, the boards are a bit bent and they're builders and there's snots of um, concrete and stuff in there. So they don't quite touch that internal leaf. And that means there's a potential for air to get from the vented cavity behind the board itself, just within the cavity. And again, mm. that's thermal bypass and like massively, massively reduced. They've done studies like 30, 40, 50, 60 percent reduction in performance. Mm. OK, um, so similar question. Um with external wall insulation and insulated cavities, would you not block up the venting? I think as we're um, explaining, uh, air tightness is so critical uh, that yes, we want to block up the vent and we don't want any vents, um, but uh, we should comment any any improvement in air tightness uh, to your property and, and dramatic improvement to insulation means you should 
look at your ventilation strategy as well. And we have uh, recently had a webinar about that. So that's available um, on the YouTube channel. Um, I think I'll just skip on there. Um, well, I would just quickly say it depends on whether they mean the vents in the cavity or the vents in the house. Mm. And on the vents in the house, yeah, you 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 make it tight and then you ventilate appropriately and just wide open vents um, possibly isn't the best solution. But but some kind of form of continuous um, mechanical ventilation is recommended. Yeah. Um, could you give us actual thicknesses? How thick was the insulation used in the ground floor and in the walls? And also, how was the gap between the wall and the floor insulation sealed? Okay, the floor insulation was 150 millimeters uh, in two layers of 75, actually. So they were cross cross lapped to avoid there being gaps between them. Um, bit anal. The internal wall insulation was 60 millimeters of PIR with the batten over and then with 25 mil between the batten, so a total of 85 millimeters. The cavity was 50 mil, so I had 50 mil of urea formaldehyde in it. And I would say that that 85 of PIR it is a bit risky. It is a bit risky in terms of moisture and and, and cold. Um, I don't think it's a problem there, but it you definitely would be wanting. It, what I'm saying is, I did it there. I wouldn't do that everywhere. So you know, it, it wants thinking about in each case. Uh, I didn't quite understand the last question, last part of the question. The join between the... Uh, the floor insulation and no. the wall insulation. Yeah, so you don't have a thermal bypass. Yes, yeah. so we have, there's an upstand. So there's an upstand on the wall. So uh, let me see if I can see it, and if you can see it in the picture. Floor, 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 floor. If you can see in this picture here, can you see that sort of silver line along the edge there? I don't know if you can. Um, that was like a 50 mil bit of insulation around the outside that comes up to the level, what will be the level of the finished floor. So it, it totally joins the insulation wall. It's continuous, basically. So what you're actually making with the floor is it's not just a flat surface. It's kind of a tray with lips around the edge and those lips join to the wall insulation. And that's another problem with EWI on cavity walls because you've got your floor inherently is insulated on the inside and the walls are inherently in, insulated on the outside. So you, you've, you've, you know, there's a disjunction. There's definitely a big chunk of masonry between the two. And so we tend, what we tend to do is to is to take the EWI down quite low. But even so, there's still there's still a bridge there. Um, OK, um, a good point for Jackie. Um... Anyone who's doing building work, if they're putting in a new kitchen or a bathroom, this, of course, is an ideal time uh, to add the internal wall insulation while the walls are, are empty of stuff. Um, is that a good time to do it? Would you give any caveats? Uh, no, I would say, I don't think, mm, I don't know. I should think harder about that. No, opportunities are fantastic. And obviously, I you know, for most people, um, a, a part by part approach to a retrofit is likely to be the most pragmatic thing that they can do. And mm. what I always look for, and I look for, even in this job, I, what I look for um, is what other opportunities are, are arising in any situation, you know, while you're doing something and you're doing something significant, it's quite easy, especially, in, and you see this quite a lot out in the world. Uh, it's quite easy just to sort of, you know, rush into a job, crack on with it and get it done tick the box uh, and move on and actually taking a bit more time and space to think about what else can be done at the same time um, can create a huge amount of extra value it might mean that you do what you're intending to do in a slightly different way and you have to adapt but it means that overall you'll get a lot more out of the opportunity okay Thank you very much. Um, we're just about coming to the end of our questions, so do chuck in any more if, if you have them. Thank you for staying with us. Um, quick question from Daniel. Uh, why did you use the, the, the parge coat? Was that in case there was a breach of the internal wall insulation? Um, I think the parge coat is necessary to give you some, a smooth surface to work on, uh, for one yeah. thing. And to yeah, although the, the block work would have been fine. I could have bonded onto the block work. No, it was as I was saying before, um, 
with it being I they were, actually it's, it's not really possible to tell but this the um the block in this house was um a very cheap form of block that they don't really use very much it's kind of cind made out of cinder from um blast furnace slag um byproduct and they're, they're horrible things very sharp when, when you break them up it's not like it's not like just normal sort of cement concrete blocks um and because of that they're sort of actually relatively porous so uh, without a parge coat there was a risk that air could move from intern inside the cavity um through the wall and into the back of the back of the um the internal insulation and yeah i mean this is a question that often comes up with people they're like do i really have to do a barge coat but yeah that's one of those where i feel confident in saying yeah you do okay um it's a tricky one just to caveat that i suppose there, there is a possibility that you could use your existing wall cover the the issue with that is if that's got a gypsum skim on it um uh my colleague esteemed colleague nick nick parsons um says that gypsum has a potential to turn to porridge once it's um if it gets wet so if you do get a problem in there and you've left gypsum in in between in your cold wet zone your 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 lime versus a cement render or, or a lime render the gypsum will just turn into sludge it won't handle moisture at all Okay, thank you. Um, here's a tricky one. Uh, the old, oldest part of our house has no footings, um, slate floor directly onto dirt and is very cold. Uh, can this be fixed is the question. What, um, what is there a straightforward solution there? Well, um, yeah. So that, that was the same situation that I have in my house that I live in currently here in Herefordshire. It's much more common in Herefordshire. Um, and yeah, that's another one of those examples where investigations are are important um i don't i don't know what this place described is like but i think we had about five inches below ground of stone wall uh, and even a, a single skin brick wall extension a, a double skin brick wall ex solid extension was the same it's just just sat on the mud and i you know i wanted to go deeper here even the house in manchester and i definitely wanted to insulate the floor I spoke to a structural engineer about the potential for um, what they call flaunching, where when you dig out, you dig out at 45 degrees from from the wall. So you leave the mud underneath the wall effectively as a kind of earth footing. And I had a structural engineer come and visit who'd specialised in, in doing this. And he said, on the kind of earth you have here, that is not recommended. So in order to insulate the floor, it required underpinning uh and i was actually looking at I, I, yeah it's a shame i don't have a picture to hand but um it's one of the guys who helped me on this job actually helped me put the, the insulation down um he kind of, he calls that kind of job um scary expensive stuff that you never get to see because yeah it, it, it's not fun kind of looking at your what they do is they cut out three feet of wall uh, they dig out down like half a meter underneath a three three foot section of wall and then they leave two three foot sections in and then they do the next three foot and then okay. they effectively build a wall above that into it and then they leave that to go off and then they do the next section and then they do it so they do it like in three sections uh, it takes a very long time it's quite expensive it does have some benefits for stone walls um the the, the again that's the looking for opportunities kind of um kind of thing in our case we had walls they're Herefordshire sandstone walls and one of them was very very wet um and doing the underpinning afforded us the possibility of putting a damp proof course in and the walls drying out and that meant that we were able to use a different type of insulation on the wall which was much much cheaper so right. again it's like you can you can think of of things that are, you know you can think of things as problematic and they are but you can look to make the best of them Right. OK, uh, we've got about 90 seconds to wrap up too much of those. Um, thank you very much for all these questions. Um, interesting question here. Internal wall insulation where you've got an old chimney flue. Any particular thoughts about that? I forgot to mention that in this picture here. Um, is where the chimney flue used to, used to be. I, just take it out. 
<laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Um, what was the product mentioned to waterproof external brickwork against driving rain? Uh, they're called brick creams. Uh, I can't think of a brand off the top of my head. Uh, but if you look up breathable brick creams. Breathable yeah. brick creams. Okay, Rick thank cream. you very much. Yeah, yeah. Um, last one then. Um, I was curious. How long did, how long did all this take you? How long were you in your rented house? Uh, seven months. Wow, I would have thought it was longer than that. Yeah, it was. It was amazing. There was literally only three of us on it. Um, obviously, I'd done a lot of the planning beforehand, but we weren't even smashing at it. it you know, it was just steady, methodical, and. Uh, yeah seven months entirely. okay well you achieved a fantastic result congratulations i'll just hand back to Gemma quickly to wrap up thanks tony lovely thank you um Gervais, would you mind just stopping sharing screen please if you could um yeah and while you're doing that thank you lovely let me just quickly get right Um, so yes, thank you, Gervais. That was brilliant. Thank you for handling all those questions as well, and to Tony for coordinating um, those two, and to all of you, our audience, for um, yeah, posing some really interesting questions there. Hope you got a lot out of it. Um, next steps wise, if you've got any other questions, any experiences, want to get in contact with us, please do building sense at hgnetwork.org. Um, Follow up wise, I will be sending you a recording of this um, so that you can listen again if you want to. There was a lot of information in there you might want to rewatch or share um, or whatever you want to do with it. I will also share details about the talk that Gervais is going to be doing with the ACB on cavity walls. So you've got a link to that um, and send the link to the air tightness and ventilation webinar that we did back in December as well. Um, because there was a lot of content in there, some overlaps, which you might find interesting. So look out for that. Um, there will also be a feedback form on there as well. If you wouldn't mind filling that in, that would be really much appreciated. And it's also your opportunity to tell us what you want to hear next, um, what topics you want. We're more than happy to come up with ideas, but we'd much rather give you exactly what you need. Um, so, yeah, please take the opportunity to fill in that feedback form when you have it. Um, in terms of upcoming webinars, we haven't got any planned at the moment. Um, that's not to say there won't be any, but they... I haven't actually got one to point you to right now. So um, you will receive, you will be on the mailing list to receive updates as and when they are booked in. We do have a bit of a, an idea coming together about doing some online green doors. So for those that are familiar with the um, green doors, green open homes format, where you go and in person look around someone's house that has been retrofit like Gervais's. Um, but we're thinking of doing an online one um, that is more where people can just come forwards, have a little chat with me about what they did, why, show, share some pictures. Um, so I'll send an email around about that. And if anyone would like to join in who has done some retrofit, that would be much appreciated. Um, Gervais, would you mind staying on just for a couple of minutes? And Tony, otherwise we're all done here. So um, yeah, thanks to all and see you next time. Bye.